I'm going to show the new stuff inside of Cinema 4D. So, but as you might have noticed, uh, we had a release two days ago, our Fall 22 release with updates to Cinema 4D, to Redshift, to Forger, Red Giant, Moves by Maxon, the Maxon app. And we also have a new versioning. And with that, I am happy and very glad to tell you more about the new Cinema 4D 2023. So we've got a few cool updates in here that I'm going to show live. Just let me quickly go through that list. We did some um, improvements to the unified simulation system. Um, we added soft body um, simulation, stickiness, target length, all that stuff. We now have vertex maps that work on generators. So field-based vertex maps can now work on primitives and almost every generator. We added a new mode for modeling with symmetry, which is also really, really neat. I'm going to show that in a few minutes. We added Open Color IO for professional color workflows when you are using Open Color IO in your studio and an improved Go Z bridge. And also, we created watch folders to the asset browser. And that's actually what I want to start with, with showing what's new in the asset browser. So here we have Vanilla Cinema 4D 2023. And the first thing I want to show you is stuff that has been added to the asset browser. So there is a new workflow of mounting databases. So if you have a look at the preferences of the asset browser, you can see that there is no way of mounting a database anymore because this has been moved to this section here in the asset browser where you can now connect databases and also watch folders. So let me add a watch folder here. And I'm gonna use my IBC project files here and open that up. So this is a folder on the drive. I can show it to you here. And whatever you add or remove from that folder will show up or be deleted here in the asset browser. So for example, when I create a copy of this one, you can see that in a few moments it will update and here is the updated file. It will generate a preview and so on. So the new place where you can manage databases, let me delete this here again. And if that doesn't update immediately, you can always go to databases and reload the databases, then it will update. The new place to organize databases is up here. So this will open up this little window and here you can see that we added this watch folder. Watch folders have a folder icon um, and databases have this database icon. You can unmount and mount, you can make it invisible or visible. Everything um, that has been possible before is now possible here. Right, and then we added a few more things for organizing uh, your files, or not organizing, but sorting and grouping the files. Let me quickly go to list view here and make this a little bit smaller. So you can see right now those assets are categorized by, well, yeah, category and or group by categories. So we have those other categories, those folders. We have scenes and we also have files in here. Um, I can adjust that with the group by down here. If I set this to none, you can see that I've got a nice um, alphabetical ordered uh, list and we can also adjust the sort by. Um, we can even define which items should come first. So if I check favorites here, and let's say we make the shark scene a favorite and also the target length scene here, then those will appear first. All right, good. Let me set this to none and also unfavorite these. And yeah, the next thing I wanted to show here is when I go and open up this folder. So you can see that there is a subcategory, the text folder. But one thing I can do is I can click this button and this will show me the assets of all of the subcategories. So now you can see that it's all unfolded. There are no hierarchies anymore. That's also quite neat sometimes. Right. When I opened this scene here, you saw or you probably saw that there has been uh, added a new watch folder, this one here. So open projects will automatically be added as watch folders here. And the folder that is being linked to the asset browser here as a watch folder can be defined here in the project settings under asset browser. And you can either connect or not connect this um, database or this folder. And right now it's pointing to the text folder. If I just delete that, 
you can see that we now have the full project folder here with the text folder and so on. That's also something that can be quite cool. Now, let me go to the next thing that I want to show. And for that, I'm going to open up the Rails scene that I created for the Asset Browser. So this is basically a rig and um, you can, yeah, open this up and see how it has been created. So basically what it's doing, it's a spline defining um, a whole train track. And yeah, you can adjust all of the stuff in here. And this is an expressor rig. And sometimes when you work on expressor rigs, um, you link some object that is here in the hierarchy to some object that is very down in the hierarchy. And it's sometimes hard to find all of these objects that are connected with each other. So with Cinema 4D release 2023, um, this has changed. Let me go to the layers here and just delete my lock layer so that I have all of the other stuff. I'm going to unfold it as well. So you can see that we've got Expresso tags here and we've got um, this, this uh, user data tag where all of the parameters are stored. Right, so let me go down the hierarchy and let's open up or let's select this um, object, the cloner, and here you can see that these parameters are driven by Expresso. You can see that by the icon. But how can we now see the connected part of it, like the driver? So what you can do since this release is you can alt-click this icon and this will bring up a little context menu and you can directly open the um, respective uh, Expresso with that. So here you can see that this is the Expresso where this object is connected or yeah, wired up. It's already selected and now you can see, all right, the seed is directly connected to the seed of the train track controls. You can also, if I deselect this and also close that, you can also just um, I'll click this again and select the other Expresso tag and then you can use the scroll to selection or shortcut S to, um, to jump directly to the two. So here you can see that the Expresso tag is selected. And another thing that is quite neat here is when you, for example, um, have your parameters here and you want to see where in the hierarchy the connected object is, you can simply alt click here and directly jump to the connected object. And now you can see that the parameters of this object are selected or are here in the attributes manager. And you can also see that it's selected here. And again, when you hit S, you can see that this is uh, the object. And of course, you can also do that again and jump back to the, um, to the controls of the whole rig. So this is something really cool when you create rigs using Expresso because it saves you a lot of time. All right, let's go to the next one. Go to my watch folders and here we have my scenes. And the next one that I'm going to show you is ACES or the implementation of open color IO. So here we go. It's loading the textures at the moment and I'm immediately going to hit the render button so that we can render something. And I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Here we go, and we just let this render for now. Right, so this is a scene using Redshift as the renderer, and down here in the project settings, you can see that there is a new color management section, and well, there has been a color management section before, but it only had the basic color man uh, management uh, attributes in there. Old scenes will always come in with color management set to basic, but you can also set it to open color IO. And once you do that, you can see that things are changing because it's adjusting the color spaces and so on. One thing that is um, necessary to know is that the scene has not been converted to open color IO. So the colors in the materials and all of the textures are still basic. When you want to convert them, you have to press the convert to open color IO button here. And this will bring up this little um, window where you can define the input color space for uh, low bit depth textures like 8 bit and 16 bit textures and the ones uh, the color space for uh, 32 bit images and the render color space once I hit OK you can see that the colors are changing a little bit again and now it is converted to open color IO and here you can see maybe let me zoom in here a little bit here you can see 
the config that is that is linked to this scene. It's the default config that ships with Cinema 4D. You can use, if you already have an established um, color pipeline, you can use your own open color IO configs and load them here and then they will come with, uh, this will come with the presets that you already had. So even here you can switch between um, the sRGB workflow and the ACES workflow and the render spaces, display spaces, view transforms, everything will adjust. Now, let me see if this rendering is finished. It is, so we can hit the render button again. So we have something to compare in a second. All right, now, one thing you have to know is that OpenColorIO is not for everyone. There are cases where you might want to stick to basic color management. For example, OpenColorIO, or ACES in particular, does not go very well with ICC profiles. So when you have to do a lot with ICC profiles, for example, then you should stick to basic, but whenever you are like in a filmic color pipeline, open color IO might be a really good choice for you. And also one thing that you need to know when you are working in an advertising agency, for example, open color IO makes it more difficult to really preserve brand colors. Um, so that might also be a, um, a case for sticking to basic. But other than that, open color IO is just awesome. Um, Another thing that I wanted to show you is when I open up the materials. Um, let me do it like that. So regarding brand colors, it is possible to pick colors and to set up your colors in different, um, with different tone mappings. Like you can use sRGB, render space, display space, and raw. That's important to know, and although um, this is the same color, you can see that it's changing quite a lot because the color space or the, the tone mapping is changing. All right, so here in the render settings, we can see when we go to Redshift that in the globals, the color management of Redshift um, is overwritten by the project settings now. And when we bring up the picture viewer again, you can now see these um, images. So here you can see the difference. Um, this is the old color space. We need to set this to project to make it show up correctly. But still, you can see that, especially in bright areas where you have these lights here, you can see that this is almost dead red space and this is almost dead blue space here. If I show you the, um, the ACES, um, version in comparison, you can see that there's a really nice fall off here. So those lights are treated really, are treated better. And as I showed you before, the view transforms can be set up here. So even here, you can set this to lock when you're in a filmic um, pipeline to raw and also to untone mapped. But in this case, the best one is the, the um, this one here. Another thing that is really great here is that Magic Bullet is also working in ACES CG. Um, and Magic Bullet has also been updated to the latest version. So we have optical diffusion here and we also have halation in here. We can just hit OK uh, to apply this and you can see that it's just looking great because it's using the optical glow um, engine here to make the lights a little bit yeah, nicer and add some atmosphere. Right, let me close all of these scenes and let me jump to the next topic. And the next big topic that I have on my list is symmetry. By the way, when you add folders as watch folders, this comes with all of the advantages of the asset browser. For example, you can tag your files, you have all the metadata in there. And um, I already tagged a few of these files, for example, with uh, 2023 and then symmetry. And now you can see that the files here are just showing up. All of the files that I tagged with symmetry and I can open up everything. All right, now let me show you the first one here. So the new symmetry for modeling is really great because it's a mode and you can see um, symmetry up here, you can activate it. And the cool thing is I'm on one side with my cursor and you can see that the other side already has got a highlight. When I select something here, the other side is selected. When I add stuff, it's being done on both sides and that's quite neat. So what I can do here, for example, is I could use the loop selection tool and select a few loops like 
these and that and this one and this one and this one and all of these are selected on the other side. Now, because I want to select these areas here too, I have to select these and then fill the selections like so. And then I can start modeling something here in or extruding. Let me extrude this just a little bit. And now we have this. What I'm using right now is the global um, space. By default, it's using global space and it's using um, the X plane as the symmetry plane. You can see that here in the symmetry hub. So there's a symmetry hub that you can dock to um, any other place. You can pin it and you can even show the planes. So now you can see this is the symmetry plane, right? We can add more of those um, and we can also um, adjust the space. So what we have here is this object like being in the center of the scene. This makes stuff easier and it's also the recommended workflow when you're modeling. But sometimes you want to add adjustments, um, but the object is already somewhere else. So let's just move this object to this place. And you can also see that it's, uh, that it's aligned differently than world space. Then we can use, for example, um, local space, local symmetry space to create uh, uh, symmetry or to add modifications using symmetry on this object. So let's do this. I'm going to select the cube here. Um, I'm going to not show the plane. So just again. Now this is a local symmetry plane. This is local X. I can have multiple at the same time. I can switch to global again. And then my symmetry plane um, is going to be here. So this is the difference between local and global. However, now let me select a few other loops. Let me select this one. Let me also select this one and uh, this one here. And now you can already see that the other side of the object has been selected. But if I want that to be even more uh, streamlined, I can simply add the other symmetry axes as well. And now you can see that I selected all of these loops and now I can extrude them a little bit and let me add a little bit more here. Let's select this loop, let's select this loop and let's select this loop and let's extrude that again. You can see all of the other corners have been selected and here we go. Now we can just enable the subdivision surface and you see that this is now the object. Right, so let me make this editable and let me show you something else because sometimes you may want other parts of the object um, to work as the symmetry axis. Let me deactivate symmetry for now. Let's say we want this to be the symmetry axis. Then we can take advantage of either um, a custom plane that we can define here. We can also pick an object for that or we can use work plane snapping. And if you didn't know, um, when we activate work plane mode, we can move or rotate the work plane that has been possible since ages. But we can now use that work plane uh, in symmetry. So let me use this loop here and align the work plane to that selection. And the way you can do that is by uh, going to this menu and then align work, work plane to selection. Here we go. Now the work plane is aligned and now we can uh, select something here on this side. Wait we have to activate symmetry, of course, and the other side will be selected too. And we can add our changes like so, and it's all uh, fine. And if we want to bring back our work plane to um, the original alignment, then we just have to align work plane to Y and this will set it back. All right. And then when you did a few adjustments here, you can have something like this or even go crazier. However, there are some cases that are a little bit more complex than just like real symmetry where both sides are the same. Like in this case, have a look at the shark. The shark is already posed, but I still might want to add some modifications here, symmetrical modifications. So I have to create a symmetry plane that is maybe not just a plane. Because watch what happens when I bring up the symmetry hub here and I activate symmetry and let me also show you the, this uh, plane. Here we go. 
Now I select some of these polygons here on one side and you can see that it's selecting some on, uh, of the polygons on the other side because there is a tolerance here. So I can bring this up and then it will select um, polygons on the other side. I can also deactivate restrict and this will select whichever polygon is closest to like the actual symmetry um, location. But that's still not what we want. I just wanted to show you that those parameters exist. What we now need is actually something that is called um, topology or type topology. So what we can do with this is we can either define an edge or polygons to act as the symmetry axis. And then it will create the symmetry based on the topology, which means that I can um, modify post characters, for example, like this one. So let me create a loop selection of this edge here. And let me set this as the selection. So define selection. Now it is defined. And I can select stuff on one side and it will be selected on the other side as well. Like so. And this also works back here. So let me select these, for example. And then we can still add modifications. So let me inset this a little bit. Let me maybe make this a fit circle like so. We can uh, adjust the inner points, project to surface, inset again, do a few modifications here like so, maybe bevel it a little bit and extrude it like so. And now you can see that we created these modifications. I don't know what sharks need those holes for, but maybe they do. Um, and yeah, what I wanted to show you is that you can still work on, yeah, on post meshes, which is perfect. So this mesh is not symmetrical anymore. The topology is symmetrical and you can use that for your modeling. But you don't necessarily have to use this symmetry axis in here. You can also, for example, just use this edge. Let's select this edge and define it as the selection. And now let's let's um, select polygons here, right? So it will break at this point where the topology is not symmetrical anymore. That's something you have to know. But other than that, I mean, look at this. How cool is that? So the other thing you can do is you can also define this uh, topological symmetry axis with polygons. You have to select at least two so that it knows the direction. And then you define the selection. And from now on, I can just select something here on this side. Wait, I, I'm still in edge mode. That's why it didn't work. So let me select these two. I'm going to go to polygon mode, define the selection. And now it works. And this is a good mode when you want a line of polygons to be the symmetry axis. I can also add more stuff here. And if I solo this, you can see that, yeah, based on the topology, this selection is symmetrical. And I can now add more stuff here, right? OK, let's jump to the crate. The crate scene is also something that is really cool because it shows, um, or I can show you the new symmetrize command and mir um, symmetrize selection. Those commands have been called mirror and mirror selection before. And what they can do is basically you select polygons or you deselect all, then it will use all polygons. And then based on the symmetry hub, you can, um, you can create the other side. So let me do this. I'm going to go to mesh, clone, and symmetrize and bring up the settings here. And what we have here is a checkbox to use the hub. We can also choose not to use the hub. And then we have the settings for the spaces and the directions of each uh, plane and a few other things that we can adjust. And once I press play, I'm going to link this to the hub. X is the symmetry axis. I'm going to hit OK. And you can see that this will be created on the other side. Now, let me undo this. And instead, I'm going to use all of these axes and when I now go to Mesh, Clone, and Symmetrize, you can see that I created the whole crate with just a single click. And now let me select a few polygons here, and there, and up here, and there. 
and let me show you the symmetry selection command. Here you can yeah, set up if you want to add the uh, selection to the existing one or subtract or flip or whatever. I just hit OK. It's linked to the hub. And now you can see that all of these polygons are selected on their symmetrical counterpart. So really, really powerful. And I've got a last one where I want to show you the um, symmetry settings for sculpting. Because here you can see that we've got a context. And the context can be switched between modeling and sculpting. Um, it is set to auto. And based on the tool, it will switch automatically. So when I now select the head here, and yeah, let's, um, let's just use model mode and go to mesh and sculpt, no, sculpt brushes and use the draw brush. Have a look at the symmetry hub. Once I choose this brush, this changes. And this is now bringing up the symmetry settings for sculpting. So all of the sculpting symmetry settings have been moved to the hub. They are not in the brush anymore. Right, and now I can sculpt here symmetrically. And another thing that has been added in Cinema 4D 23 um, is that you can hold down Shift and with every or any um, sculpt brush, it will go to the smooth brush. Right. Still, this isn't everything that I want to show you with symmetry. Let me switch to the paint tool and let's create a vertex map. We are still on um, symmetry here. Let me create some vertex map here. You can see that it's mirrored over to the other side. And the same thing works with vertex colors. So let me adjust or create some vertex colors and then we can adjust yeah, the color <clears throat> just to just to show you that all colors are supported here so symmetry works totally fine right that's great i'm going to close all of these close all projects yep 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 and we will continue with another topic and that is simulation let me bring up a few of these scenes so we will start with stickiness so let's play back this scene and what you can see is like a few noodles and a few meatballs that are rolling across or over these noodles and i want those meatballs to pick up the noodles right how can i do that using the new stickiness. That's the answer. So what I can do is I can go to the, to the tags here, to the simulation tags, and these are the soft body tags. And down here, you can see that there is a parameter called stickiness. Now, if I just bring up the stickiness of those meatballs, you will see that they are still not picking up the noodles. And this is because everything that should be sticky or that is part of the stickiness simulation needs to have at least a tiny little bit of stickiness. So let me go to the noodles here and you can see that I use the rope tag. There are a lot of, of sweeps in here and therefore a lot of rope tags. So I can go to the object manager filters and I double click the rope tag and this will select all of my rope tags, all uh, 32. And now I'm just gonna increase the stickiness to one. And as I press when I press play, you can see that it's now picking up the noodles. It can also be just a tiny little bit, like 0.1, and then I can bring up the stickiness of, uh, of the meatballs. That would also work. But just that you know that you have to add stickiness to all um, objects that are supposed to um, be part of the stickiness simulation. Another thing that you can do here is when you bring up the stickiness uh, setting of the rope, if you bring it up too high, like let's say 10, you can create those those knots here. And then you can also bring this down again and work with that, for example. So this is something you can also use to create some sort of knots. The next thing I want to show is target length. So when I press play here, you can see that this is just a curtain like falling down. but 
one thing that we have in cloth now is a target length parameter, this one. And of course, we can um, adjust that. And as I bring this up here, you can see that the whole um, carpet is going up. Let me animate this. So at frame zero, I want this at 100%. I'm going to set a keyframe. I'm going to go to frame 20 and bring this down to, let's say, 50%. Set a keyframe, go to frame one and press play. There we go. That's a lot here, but I want to show you something else. All of those parameters can be driven by a vertex map. And vertex maps are just awesome. You can just paint them like that. And using the vertex map, you can define which parts should um, adjust their target length and which shouldn't or are not allowed to do that. So I'm just going to drag and drop the vertex map in here. And uh, watch what happens when I press play now. It's doing something like this. So it's just using those stripes that you just saw in the vertex map to reduce the target length. And now, because of the weight of the other parts that are not weighted here in the vertex map, I have to bring up or bring down the target length here a bit more because those other parts are pushing it down again. Gravity is in the scene. So here we go. This is something you can do with target length. Right, let's go to the next one. And the next one is actually something I want to show you in a file that I create from scratch. I'm going to create a plane, make it a little bit bigger. And I'm also going to make it a simulation collider and I'm going to make it invisible. And then I go to the asset browser and search for the horse and just add this. And I'm going to show you soft bodies using the horse. Why the horse? Not because um, I want to torture horses, but because it has some attributes that are really nice to show you simulation um, and soft body features. It has thick parts like the body and it has very thin parts like the ears and the legs. And that's why I'm using the horse. So let me go to simulation tags and we can directly choose the soft body tag, but we can also go with a cloth tag so that I can show you some differences. Right. So now the cloth tag is in here and once I play the animation, the horse is just falling down. I also chose this because it's looking funny. All right, let's bring up the bendiness a bit and let's bring up the stretchiness um, a bit. And this way, the horse is just like falling down um, even more and it is less rigid. Let me also throw this into a subdivision surface and whenever you simulate something and have a, a generator, also in the scene or attached to, to that object, it's a good idea to go to the project settings and under simulation, under scene, to activate simulate before generators. That's also important when you have a cloth simulation and want to clone other objects onto the vertices of this cloth simulation. Then you need to tick simulate before generators to make this work. All right, now let's hit play. Right. Good. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to add soft body um, constraints here. And you can do that by just going to soft body and enable, uh, enabling soft body. Now you can see that there are a lot of lines inside of the volume here. And these are constraints that are trying to, to keep the length from one side to the other. So let me quickly show this to you by bringing up the, the lines here in the shading. So let's say we uh, want to have a look at this constraint here. This constraint goes to the other side. Well, let's hope I can find it here. I think it's this one. So, and it's trying to keep that length. Now, let me press play. And you can see the difference already. Now, still the thin parts are very soft body and the body is a bit more rigid. And we can adjust that by either playing with the softness, but I'm going to leave that um, on for now. You can also choose whether you want to draw these lines or not. I want to draw them right now because I want to show you how this works. So you have these constraints. These are called poles. And there is one or a maximum of one pole per point. But I can bring this up 
And the more I bring this up, the more poles are there and the stiffer the object will be. And if I bring this up to, let's say, 10 and press play, I'm going to set this off here, you can see that it's way stiffer now already. There are still some funny things going on. For example, the legs are very wiggly and also the ears are very wiggly. There you go. So, yeah, in the end, my goal is to make this horse stand. However, in the meantime, I'm also going to show you a few other parameters. There is a minimum length and a maximum length for those poles. So if I bring up the minimum length, you can see that the poles are disappearing from the legs. And this means that now there are no soft body constraints in the legs, but still in the body. So the legs are just going to collapse. Also, the neck is collapsing a little bit. You can see that um, also the head is a little bit more soft body, but the main body of the horse is still um, pretty much intact. So let's go to the, uh, to the next parameter. We also have a max length, but this is not doing any significant change here. Another thing that is important is the spread. So if I bring this down, you can see what it's doing. Let's go to the legs. So here you can see um, that the spread is like shooting array from the point to the opposite direction and based on an angle um, it's going to create a, another constraint or pole or not. That's the spread and with this we would have a lot of um, constraints that are keeping the thickness of the or the diameter of the um, of the leg but none that would help us to keep this at the same length or to, to make it more stable like um, in y direction. So we can bring this up and this will create all of these connections and now let's have a look at the simulation again. It's still falling down, right? But the last thing that I want to show you um, in here is the shoot side. So right now this is just shooting rays or creating those constraints in the volume of the object. But we can adjust the shoot side to both and this will create um, poles also outside of the volume and now if I press play you can see okay now it's way more stable and everything I need to do now to make this horse really stand is I need to bring down the softness like so you can see it's standing but then oh no it's falling all right let's uh, bring this down even more let's see if five works five doesn't work let's go with two and two should work so here we go, that's it. Another thing that you can do that is quite funny is, um, at least in this case, um, you can, well, bring down the spread again and control the direction using a field. You can use a linear field for that. So let's do this, let's do this in Y direction. So it's just creating um, constraints in this direction. And yeah, let's hit play. And then it looks like that. <laughs> All right. So now that the horse is set up completely, let me delete this, we can do all sorts of funny things with that. For, exam uh, for example, we can add another sphere and make it a little bit smaller and make it a collider. And then when we press play, we can just do stuff like this with the horse and yeah. Lots of funny things are possible. All right, let me jump to the next one, which is uh, the donut. And what I want to show you here is the new mix animation. So when you enable simulation, it's just there, no matter if you animated this object. So what we can do now is when we go to the cloth or soft body tag, we can go to mix animation and activate our mix animation. We can do that with pins. Pins is the very accurate uh, method that is really pulling all of the points towards the position of the, yeah, of the animated object like so. And this way, now you can see, well, it, there, there is not a lot going on when it comes to, to simulation. But if I bring down the influence, you can see that we create a good mix of a controllable animation 
that has simulation applied to it. And we can do the very same, not by using pins, but uh, by using a force. And this is pretty similar to what we have in the uh, dynamics tag, in the rigid body dynamics, for example. Um, it's called follow position or follow rotation. This is what this parameter is doing. We can set this up to, to be five or even to be 10. And then another thing that we can do is uh, we can animate this. So let me go here and let me animate the strength down from 10 to zero, set another keyframe. And then you can see that we're totally mixing this and this way we can throw objects. It's also cool. Right. Let me go to the next one, next topic. And that topic is vertex maps on generators. So this is a generator. You can see it's a text spline with an extrude and I can press play and then it will fall down. And at some point it will be picked up again. And whoop, there we go. The thing is vertex maps only worked on polygonal objects so far. Now they are working on all primitives and most of the generators, for example, the extrude here. And the good thing is that we can now even adjust the text here. So let's go with what's up. Here we go. And we press play. Maybe let me deactivate the subdivision surface to make it a little bit faster. There we go. And maybe let me also recreate these these poles here we go now this is falling down and going up again right and the way this works is by using the vertex map so here we've got the vertex map and as i scrub through the timeline you can see that yeah we are using a vertex map on a generator let me delete the vertex map and let me just create a new one. So we go to other tags, vertex map. Here we have it. And now we can just use those fields in there. So the thing that you need to know is that on generators, because it needs to be procedural, um, field based um, weights are supported. So now it's just going down, but not going up again to achieve that we need to add the other one as well and set this to multiply in this case and then it will work the same thing works with uh, vertex colors so here I've got another another example like this so I created a volume here and the volume measure has got vertex colors on it, a vertex color tag. And here I use the very same objects that I used to create the volume to create those vertex colors. Um, I'm running out of time a little bit, so I will show you this as a rendering. So let's go to my renders and let me bring up this one. Let's go to the filters and bring up the gamma a little bit like so. And now when I press play, you can see this is what's possible. So you you create um, yeah, organic shapes and you can use fields to colorize them. And therefore, yeah, you can tell this sphere, for example, to just stay in one color or you can add another field to colorize it. You can uh, read colors from textures and add them. So this is really cool. Great. So let's go to the next one. And the next one is something that has been added to Redshift that I'm really happy about, and that is material stacking. So when I render this, you can see that um, there are no labels and uh, stuff on it. But when you are in visualization, when you want to visualize a product or uh, some industrial stuff, anything where you need a label, a sticker and so on, um, until now, that was a pretty, um, yeah, a pretty cumbersome workflow um, with Redshift. But now we can just create textures that have an alpha uh, or materials that have an alpha in it, 
And then we just add it to the card, or in this case, to the card box, to any um, object. And you can see that it's already stacking. So it's on top of, um, uh, of the box, of the, of the paper material. And now we can set the projection to flat. I'm going to fit this to the object and I'm going to go to texture mode and this way, let's bring it up to the front here, we can move it and it will follow. We can also scale it down. Now there are going to be a lot and I'm just going to deactivate the tiling and this way I just have this sticker here and I can move it around, I can rotate it and so on. And I can do the very same with this one here. Let's just set this to to flat projection and to not tile and let's make it smaller like so and there you go so here we have it that's great and the last thing I want to show before I wrap up um, is actually uh, something that has to do with ZBrush um, I'm gonna create a new scene and I'm going to set the renderer to Redshift. And now I'm going to jump to ZBrush. And I've got this fantastic dragon model by pre Christian. That's fan art from Game of Thrones. But what we can do here is uh, let me just select this dragon. And when I bring this over to Cinema 4D, or when I want this, I just press the Go Z button. I can do this with all or just the visible ones. I'm just going to use the body for now. Um, because of time reasons. And here it is. So that's it. Now let's add some uh, dome light at least. And let's render this. And the thing that has been created here is not just the object, but it also created a redshift material for that. And now you can see the displacement is there. The displacement is also there in the right, um, using the right height. And it's yeah, totally, totally working. And here you can see the material. It's a Redshift material with this um, GoZ standard node in it. And another thing that has been changed here is that we now support uh, polygroups. So in the polygroups tag, we can now select polygons directly from those polygroups that you can create inside of ZBrush. You can also add some inside of Cinema 4D and then transfer them over uh, to ZBrush and so on. Right, okay, I have to wrap up. I think I didn't forget anything, so thank you.